Last week, John actually did a little bit of chapter 7 and a little bit of chapter 9. He's, he's a little ADD, so we get along really, really well. Um, he's also a phenomenal, phenomenal storyteller and preacher. And um, it's quite amazing to be able to, to be in a little church and get to hear a guy like John. So he's not here so I can brag about him. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm very, very blessed, and I think we're all very blessed to have him around. Um, but we've been going through Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. I mean, at, at its core, that's kind of what it's about. And um, the question of why rebuild the wall, I, that, that gets a little lost on our culture because we don't have a walled city of Seattle. Um, but the wall meant that the people couldn't thrive. Um, without a wall, it just meant it was open season for bandits, for animals, for anybody who wanted to come and attack. Um, and so there would be robbers and theft and mayhem. And um, and I've kind of brought this up again and again, but John 10.10 10 is, is really a crucial kind of backbone verse that, that sums up what this knowing Jesus and following Jesus thing is all about. And it says, um, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, a city without a wall was open season for stealing, killing, and destroying. And... Um, and yet Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, and that you might have it to the full, that you might have it abundantly, um, even beyond what you could imagine. And um, I think our lives are a little bit like that. There are forces in our lives and, and even in ourselves and in our world um, that want to still kill and destroy the things that God would like to do for us in giving us abundant life. And thankfully, we have a good shepherd who is willing to lay down his life to give us life and protect us. And... and so we're in this story of um, needing a wall to be built and um, what it means to have a wall of God around us that um, strengthens us and sets our life on a good path. And so, um, so we've been tracking this wall being rebuilt, and at the end of chapter 7, the wall is finally done. The wall is finally built, there's a big celebration, and the book doesn't end. It seems weird for a book about rebuilding a wall. Um, but I think it's really, really purposeful because they needed something more than just their physical surroundings to be safe. They needed something more than just a market that they could have safely without being attacked. They needed, um, they needed not only their physical health and safety, um, they needed some, some spiritual health. Um, by the way, just a quick illustration of uh, what happens when we don't feel safe. Uh, we never thrive when we're not safe. Um, have you ever worked in a hostile work environment with a boss who who you, you needed to worry about a lot? Um, you're always on edge. You, it doesn't produce your best work. Um, if you've ever been in a combative relationship with somebody, you'll find that it never brought out the best out of both of you. Uh, this, this sense of safety is so crucial to our life. Um, and... Um, for the people to thrive, they needed not only to be physically safe, but they needed to be spiritually safe. And chapter 8 gets into what does it look like to meet God again. And that's what these people were doing, was meeting God again and discovering how good God is. Um, a lack of, uh, by the way, spiritual health is, is what this, this chapter is about. And in spiritual, I don't know about you, but sometimes spirituality feels kind of vague and fuzzy. Uh, it's not very quantifiable, um, and uh, but it's. I was trying to put my finger on it, and I think it's the ability to be in harmony with yourself, with your God, and with other people. That's that's crucial to be able to be at peace, um, and have a sense of well-being and purpose in your life. That is that is what spiritual health is all about, and a lack of it um, is absolutely devastating. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt like you're in a really dark place, but my experience of not being spiritually healthy, when I was wandering about experiencing, trying to figure out life and, and do life as best as I could, um, it felt like wandering around in a really dark room that was unfamiliar with the lights off, and it, it was a series of me doing life by trial and error. You kind of go along in a direction, and then you crash into something, and something bad happens, and you... you uh, you have a, a bad interaction and, and you cause some damage, but then so you decide to go another way and, and you're just bumping around through life. Um, 
And each time I tried to uh, get my life going in the right direction, it seemed like it was disappointing. Uh, like, wow, I, I went out on this, this thing and it, it didn't turn out to be all I expected it to be. And then, um, worse yet, you try something and it backfires. Um, I know at one point I really decided that uh, I was tired of being lonely. I, I was working in food service um, with some folks who I, I honestly couldn't speak their language. So even at work, I didn't have anybody to talk to. And um, so I'm like, I'm just gonna throw parties. And, and I thought just having people around would be great. Um, and that sort of backfired. It didn't set my life in the right <laughs> direction for some reason. But, um, but uh, that darkness, uh, without, without that and having been in that, um, it got bleak. It got really bleak for me. And um, I think it's safe to say that, that most of us can agree that just material stuff, just our physical lives are not all of us. Um, what is on your wish list for, for stuff? Like, what would make you really happy in terms of material possessions right now? I mean, Christina and I just moved into a new house, and that's very exciting. Um, and it's got, got me thinking, like, well, would having a boat over summer, that would be really cool. That would make me kind of happy, I guess. Um, would it be going on a big trip? I mean, maybe not Sweden. But well, would going on a big trip be a, a, a good thing? Um, I think all of those things, the material stuff that you can buy, what you find at the end of it is that you're still you, and you're still stuck with you. Um, <laughs> that's what I learned by moving to California once. I'm like, I'm tired of this whole Seattle thing. I don't like it here. I'm moving. I moved to California. And I got to California and found out I was still me and still stuck with me. Um, <laughs> We can have all the material stuff in the world, and I wish I could give you all the stuff that you might be longing for so that you could realize that um, at the end of the day, we need more than that. And that's what spiritual life is all about, a sense of well-being, a sense of connection with God. And um, in Jesus, that is remarkably close God. It's a beautiful thing. I was in Arizona working in college ministry there, and I would hang out in coffee shops, and I met this guy, and, and we would philosophize about God together and I remember one day there was like this turning point in the conversation where I go um, I think God is more personal than you think like you can actually know God as a matter of fact I, I talk to him most days and he's like what it doesn't make any sense you're crazy you talk to God and I go yeah he, he kind of talks back in his own way I mean it's not like an audible voice but there's this God that you can know and that you can walk with. And as we walk with this God, he does a remarkable thing. He, um, Psalm 40 describes it as, he picks us up out of the miry clay and he sets our feet on solid ground. Um, Psalm 23 talks about, he leads us, um, sets calm waters and, and gives us um, places where we can thrive. And so these, these folks, having got their walls built, they're ready to go. Um, here's what they did next, and here's why the book continues. The first three verses of chapter 8. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in the towns, all the people were assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. And so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate, and in the presence of the men and the women and others, and all who could understand, and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. You guys think I preach a long time. Daybreak to noon, that's what we're going to do. Um, they read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Yes, they did. Um, and it says the law, but that was just the first five books of the Bible. And, and if you read those books, you find two crucial things. Um, one you find is story. Um, you find the story of creation, and then you find the story of Abraham and Moses, and you find this God who personally intervened in the lives of 
whole bunch of people, brought them into relationship with him, and said, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to a whole bunch of other people. It was a big, big story that these folks were a part of. Um, and it's a story that we're a big part of. And, and I'm starting to find and starting to think that it's maybe more and more important. What kind of a story are we a part of? I mean, is our life really about just going to work, getting a paycheck, coming home, and trying to be as happy as we can be in the midst of that? I'd like to think we're part of a bigger story. And with God, we're invited into this 4,000-plus-year story of how God is trying to do something in the world. The other stuff in there is a list of um, brilliant legal system. It was given to slaves coming out of Egypt, so they weren't used to governing. And it was the most just, graceful, peaceful way to live that protected them as they wandered through the desert. Um, it's, it's a brilliant thing that our God gave them. And um, in essence, all they did was they got together and they, they listened to God's word and tried to figure out well, what does it mean to us about our lives. Sound vaguely familiar? Uh, might be something we're doing right now. Um, it's something that happens at our small groups on a regular basis. Um, and then uh, in this chapter, it gives them the slow-mo version of like, Here's exactly how it went down. And I think it's crucial how this went down in this reading. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. And beside him on the right was a whole bunch of people whose names were really hard to say. And on his left was a whole bunch of people whose names were really hard to say. But they were basically the leaders at the time. And Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. It's interesting. So he pulls out the book, he's getting ready to read, and everybody stands up in anticipation of this. And he's so overwhelmed by this that he goes, God, you are utterly amazing. You have created all of these things you love, you care for us. What an amazing God you are. And everybody says, yes, that is right. The very first part of this spiritual relationship of, of meeting God again was worship. Um, worship doesn't make sense in our culture a lot. I have more than a few conversations that start off with Basically, why would I give up Sunday morning to go to church? That seems weird. Um, and yet, it is timeless and it is crucial because I think it recalibrates our relationship with God. It sets us back into knowing that the world isn't just on our shoulders, that we're not on our own, and that there is a God who is large and in charge, and he is with us and he is doing something. Um, at camp, I... Uh, used to work with kids at camp and, and we'd get really tired by the end of the season like summer season was up and we're just exhausted we've, we've all been working way too hard um, totally tapped out and I came up with this game to try to like give myself rest while entertaining a group of children and it was called counselor serving and what I would do is I would lay on the ground and then the kids could walk up onto my back and pretend to serve <laughs> That's a fantastic idea, right? Until the end of summer when I could hardly get in my car because my back was just shot. I mean, I had had kids surfing on it for weeks by this point. And um, I could barely get into my car. And so I went to go see a chiropractor. And, um, and he's like, oh, dude, what did you do? I didn't tell him about counselor surfing. I tweaked my back, I guess. Um, but the guy threw a couple snaps and pops and cracks, put my back into a spot where all of a sudden I could move and I could breathe and I could work again. Um, and worship does that with our souls. It puts us back in a spot where we can go, oh yeah, that's right. It's a God who loves me and who cares about me and is much bigger than me. And I'm a part of his story. And so now I can move forward in the way I was intended to. Um, 
The other thing that um, worship does is it um, it inspires us, and and when I think of spiritual inspiration, I think of like big moments. I think of like going on a mission trip to some foreign country that absolutely blows my mind and doing something spectacular in the world or um, I think of like a spiritual retreat I went on where I got to sit by this lake and they had encouraged us like take a half an hour and be in silence. Now I may be good luck with that but I'm sitting there by the edge of this lake and I'm like ooh birds <laughs> um, but eventually I slowed down enough to be like oh there's a lot of trees here look like little arrows pointing up to heaven. I wonder why. Um, and then as I slowed down even more, I remember this moment where I was looking on the lake and it was just still. And that scripture, be still and know that I'm God, popped into my head. And I'm like, God is right here with me. And it feels stronger than I've felt in a long time. Um, that was a moment of inspiration for me. And I think there's a part of our spiritual lives where we crave these big, big moments of inspiration. But I think there's a myth about inspiration. I've been thinking about how John writes books. Um, and he really, he has to put himself into his uh, like house and close the door so he's not interrupted because he's got a deadline and this chapter needs to get written like yesterday. It's sheer urgency. There is not a, a great, brilliant moment of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm no author like him. I haven't published anything, but I do know for about 10 years, I wrote poetry. I wrote literally hundreds of poems. And what I discovered about inspiration was that um, it can actually be crafted. Um, if I go into a coffee shop and I have an insane amount of coffee <laughs> and I have an empty journal and I let myself verbally spew on the page, eventually I will find myself writing hopefully a halfway decent poem. Um, I think the myth of encountering God and the myth of inspiration is that uh, we can actually have that be a regular part of our life. Um, and it begs the question, what does our look, life look like and are we giving God access to opportunities to get a hold of us? Um, for me, that looks interesting. I got church. Um, I get a couple meetings during the week where I have a small group and then... Um, Kind of the mystery flavor of the month. I'm not a routinized guy, so the Bible through the year and a plan has never lasted me a year. Um, I think it lasts about mid-January, a little <laughs> later. Um, but then I pick up something else. <clears throat> it's maybe looking at art, or it's um, reading some journal, or uh, getting a devotional sent to my phone. Um, for some of us, it's hiking. For some of us, it's serving others. For some of us, it's it's getting involved in a cause that God wouldn't want to be a part of. But um, the encouragement here is if you meet God somewhere, do that more often. It's pretty simple. Um, these people met God in his word, and so they got together, and they listened to what his word had to say. Um, now, how that struck them was... Um, I don't think what the priest had expected after this great praise time. Uh, let me read it for you. It says, Then Nehemiah the governor and Ezra the priest and the scribes and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Don't mourn and weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drink and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to the Lord. Don't grieve. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people and said, Be still, for this is a sacred day. You don't have to grieve. And then all the people went away and ate and drank and sent portions of food to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. Encountering God means that we have to change at some level. And these folks um, encountered God. And this is, this is the part of like just if, if we decide we're only going to encounter God through hiking or gardening or something, it doesn't actually ask us to change at all. There's a part of encountering God, especially in community and especially in his word, where something comes up and we go, eek, 
that's not quite right. I'm out of alignment here. Something needs to shift in my life. Um, I know for me, small groups are a big part of that. As I bring stuff up and as I share what's going on in my life, um, I find myself saying the same thing again and again, and I go, that's weird. Why do I keep saying that? And other people go, that's weird that you're saying that. Maybe something could adjust here. Um, and they give me another perspective. Um, what I love about these people in this story is, is that they, they took it seriously. They go, man, how are we living? How does God want us to live? They heard how God wanted them to live. And it, and it struck them to the core. They go, man, this, this is not right. There's a grief and a sadness that comes with that. When I um, came to faith, there was a part of that that was um, sad that I had wasted years. It was sad as I thought of memories um, of, of, like, one of my lowest points was, was watching my mom just cry. Um, and I remember that vividly. There's, there was grief over friends that I had lost along the way. Um, but then Ezra points them to something new, and it's the same thing that I didn't get at the time. And it's the same thing that I think we lose track of, even if we've gotten so used to walking with the Lord. And it's that you got a reason to celebrate. God just opened up a doorway, and now you're about to enter an abundant life that you didn't know you even had. And it's right here with you. The great thing about Jesus is he moved into the neighborhood, as the message says. Um, God is close. He's right here, and he wants to give us an abundant life. So we have a reason to celebrate. And then it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Walking with God can bring joy. Um, the other thing that I don't think these folks got, and it was as they were listening to the law, they got caught up in a list of rules. Um, and especially today, one of the beauties that we have of Jesus Christ is when you watch Jesus relate with people, um, there's a whole bunch of people in the Bible who don't feel like they uh, really should be a part of the religious order. Actually, he gets really mad at the people in the religious order, which scares me a lot. Um, but there's a bunch of people who were deemed unacceptable to God for whatever it was that was going on in their lives. And, and we all have our parts that um, disappoint God, perhaps. And yet Jesus seems to go up to them and go, oh yeah, this is my person. I love this one. As a matter of fact, this one uh, realizes their need for me, and so they're blessed even more. This is actually how often he uses the words daughter or sister or friend with the people that we thought were unacceptable is absolutely my blowing. So Jesus is coming along and going, no, I love this one. And the picture that he paints of who God is, even in that prayer that we just prayed, our Father um, who art in heaven, he uses this word Abba, and it means daddy. It's close, it's intimate. And they were so used to talking about God as, as far off and distant and, and ready to judge according to his measure, which was the right measure. And you better hope you were on the right side of that measurement. And um, he says, no, God's not far off. He's this loving father. And, and if he didn't have a loving father, that's harder to imagine. But I think you know how much it would have been great to have. And if you did have a loving father, you appreciate what that did for you and your story. And, God, and Jesus says, we have this loving father who absolutely is rooting for us, loves us, guides us, directs us, and wants to care for us. And that was a part of this story of going, no, you don't need to weep and grieve. This God who loves you is right here and close. Um, And so, they round the corner. They have a joyful celebration. They send um, to the poor. There's always love and grace in the midst of it, extended to people. Um, but there's one piece that they still needed to do. Um, and it's a crucial piece if we're going to have a spiritually healthy life. Because there is joy in the discovery of what God has for us. And there's joy in imagining what God could do in us. Um, but let me read for you 13 through 17, because it gets into this piece. It says, On the second day of the month, the heads of the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the scribe, to give attention to the words of the law. And they found written in that law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths, 
during the feast of the seventh month. And they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country, bring back branches from olive wood and wild olive trees and myrtles and palms and shade trees and make for yourself booths as it is written. And so the people went out and they brought back branches and they built themselves booths on their roofs and in their courtyards and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate, the one by the gate of Ephraim. And the whole company that had returned from exile built booths and they lived in them. And from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this. And their joy was very great. <clears throat> they put something into practice that they found. And that's where the real joy is, I think. Um, the Feast of Booths, it was a week of living in a homemade tent. Okay, we're going to go get a bunch of branches, we're going to build a tent somewhere on our place where we live, and we're going to live there for a week. That is absolutely meaningless. <laughs> Unless it gets connected to the story, which is God brought some people out of Egypt where they were slaves, and they had to set up booths for themselves, tents in which to live. And this was a time to remember how God cared and provided for them. And so they built tents and they lived in them and they thought about how God had taken care of them and provided for them in sketchy tents. These are a bunch of people who have just gotten done with a life-threatening adventure of trying to build a wall around their city while being attacked. And so they sat and they thanked God and their little homemade shelters and they put something that they saw into practice. And it harkens back to the celebrations of Joshua a long, long, long time ago. A big, big story of God continually caring for and providing for his people that stretches way beyond just their experience. There is a joy that comes into our life when we put into practice the things that we find from the Lord and we say, I'm going to try to do this and I'm part of the 4,000 plus year story of this happening and God doing beautiful things through it. Um, Christina has been on this adventure um, of doing a journal of Thanksgiving. Kind of cool. So every day she takes a picture of something that she's thankful for. And I don't even know where she posted. She was asking me like, can I do this on Instagram but not have people see it? <laughs> I said, well, I think that Instagram's made for people to see it, so I don't know if that'll work. So I don't know clue where these pictures are. But I was asking her the other day, how is this affecting you to do this journal of Thanksgiving? And she said, well, it reminds me that I have a lot um, of things to be happy about instead of just things to be frustrated about, which always seem to be at the front of my mind. Um, and it's helping me see the bright side of life, I guess. Now, I think that's really, really cool. Um, I'm not doing it, but I think it's really, really cool. <laughs> guess who's experiencing the joy of the Thanksgiving journal? Well, Christina is, but I'm kind of vicariously watching going, that's neat. So I'm in the spot of discovering it. She's in the spot of doing it. Guess who's getting more out of it? Um, my hope for us this summer is that this can be a summer of discovering how much God loves us. It can be a summer of, of encountering God again. And most importantly, that this could be a summer of us saying, God, I'm going to walk with you in some way, and us getting to celebrate what abundant life looks like as we do that. Um, so that's the plan for the summer. And someday we'll also get through the series on the Nehemiah. We've been here a while. And I'm itching to get back to Jesus a lot right now. But um, we're coming up on the end of this book. And, and we'll do something else. But um, there is something really, really powerful in meeting God. And whether you have walked with him forever or you haven't, um, he's right here. He loves us. And he's opening up doors for us to walk with. So um, let's do that. Let's do it together. Let's do it separately and then see what God can do. Let's pray. God, um, thank you that you
you are a God who is close, who loves us, and who cares for us. Thank you that you didn't stay distant, um, that you didn't stay far off, and, and you really do invite us um, into relationship with you. And so um, do what you do and help us to build spots into our lives where we can be aware of what you do. Um, help us to connect with you and to, to look into your word and to experience you in, in the ways that you speak to us. Um, we want to walk with you, God, and we invite you to be not only the one who saves us, but also the one who guides us and directs us as our Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen.